Long time no see, but now I'm finally back and in this video I'm making a doll who won the poll I posted in the community tab. In there I only revealed that it was a Japanese mythology inspired doll and today I can finally tell and show you everything about her. Let's check it out! This doll was inspired by a Japanese monster called Futakuchi Onna, which literally means two-mouthed woman, because she has a second mouth on the back of her head, <laughs> which means that this project will include a serious head modification. In order to be able to resculpt her head, I needed to shrink her head in acetone to make it harder and more stable. Her head became so hard that I couldn't cut it open with a knife anymore and had to use a Dremel tool. Then I needed to place some sort of a filler material inside to work as a base for her oral cavity. This foam egg will work perfectly, because its form is somewhat close to an oval and the material is light. In my work I try to distribute the weight as evenly as possible for those to be able to stand properly and in this case hold their head straight, because too much epoxy might pull her head back. If you don't have a foam egg, you can use aluminium foil, silk clay or something like that instead. Then I apply a thin layer of epoxy scalp to smooth up the form and scalp the mouth, working my way from mouth and tongue to the teeth. As a reference for sculpting I used photos of shark's teeth, because in my opinion they have one of the most fascinating jaw structures. They not only have several rows of sharp and strong teeth, but they can also shed their teeth and grow new ones thousands of times. Imagine if humans could do that, no more implants would be needed and dentists would be like and another reason why I chose a shark and not for example a goose in that Japanese cuisine mostly consists of seafood and rice and I thought using a fish mouth would turn it into a nice pun like you are what you eat <laughs> kind of thing. What's interesting, Futakuchi Onna herself is not really a dangerous monster. The majority of monsters in Japanese folklore were either items or human before they turned into a yokai, and so was she. Usually she comes as a punishment for greedy people who don't feed their female family member properly. For example, in one of the legends there was a man who was so greedy that he didn't want to feed his wife and rather stayed single, until he met a woman who barely ate anything but still worked a lot and married her. But as soon as they moved in together the food started to mysteriously disappear. And one day he secretly stayed home to spy on his wife and found out that she had a huge mouth hidden on the back of her head and her hair worked as arms, stuffing it with twice as much food as an average human could eat. So, as they say, the greedy man pays twice. Another legend tells about a stepmother who fed her own kids with plenty of food but let her stepdaughter starve to death, and sometime after the girl passed away, a huge mouse grew on the back of the mother's head and started to curse her and demand food with the voice of her dead stepdaughter. I'm not going for a traditional design this time, it's gonna be modern or even with a kind of cyberpunk vibe, so I came up with a slightly different backstory for my character. I imagine her being born in a poor family and losing her family when she was young. Then she was adopted by her distant relatives who used her as maid in their house and treated her poorly. When she turned 16, she ran away and had to survive on the street. Also looking at her now, I feel like she could have become a street artist, because it's pretty common for artists to not feel hunger as they get carried away working on a new project. If you have another idea on what her backstory could be, you can write it in the comments and I'll pin the comment I like the most.
Meanwhile, I'm done with sculpting and can move on to the face up. Before applying any paint off camera, I cleaned off any oil and dust of her head with alcohol and primed it with Mr. Super Clear Sealant. Even though I start with changing her skin tone today, I prefer to use MSC as a primer because it helps the paint to stick better and be applied smoother without leaving brush strokes. It took me about 5 thin layers of paint to get a decent coverage. I paint her mouth and gums first, because these parts are harder to reach and paint without touching the teeth. At first I took a bit too cold pink color, but then switched it with a warmer, more flesh looking shade. While the paint is still wet, I apply some light pink paint for highlights and blend it with the main color. I use the same technique to create a smooth transition from the gums to the skin. When the gums are ready, I paint her teeth with two layers of ivory paint. For the back teeth, I mixed some brown paint into ivory for some extra dimension and used it for some light shading on the other teeth. On camera it's not really visible because the light is too bright, so let's just imagine that it is there. Next up is her face. I use watercolor pencils for her eyes and acrylic paint for her lips. This time her face up was more challenging than usual because first of all I shrunk her head and it's much smaller than a typical monster high head, but also because pencils hate acrylic paint. But I solved this problem by using watercolor pencils not as pencils but as watercolor. Like this I can make thinner lines than with acrylics and yet get more pigment and smoother coverage than if I would use them purely as pencils. There is a good video by Leona's workshop where she is showing and explaining why pencils don't work together with acrylic paint. I'll leave a link to her video in the description box or in the comment section or both, so please check it out. In the beginning of this year her channel got in trouble because it got hacked and as a result she's lost many followers. Some of them might even be you, so now that she's got her channel back it's time for those who got lost to return to Konoha. Don't you worry one bit, I'm gonna bring Sasuke back! Meanwhile you can see that my face up comes out quite ugly <laughs> and I think it is the eyebrows. But the layer was already sealed, so I had to use sandpaper to remove the parts I didn't like and then correct the form with pastels and white acrylic paint, using it as a concealer. I think the positive part of changing the skin tone with acrylic paint is that even if some part of the face up doesn't work the way you want it, you can always just paint it over it and start new, or use watered down acrylic paint to reduce the amount of blush for example, and it will look natural. In other cases I would have to wipe the whole face with acetone and start new. When the face up is ready and sealed, I add some piercings to her face with super glue.
A face up came out pretty simple this time, but I think it works the best with the elements I'll add later on. And as a final touch, I wanna add some gloss to her big mouth to make it look wet. In my supplies, I have gloss and semi-gloss transparent acrylic paint, but I don't wanna use them because they usually feel kinda sticky as a final coat. Instead, I wanna use enamel paint. This paint is the most reliable medium I know, but you need to be careful when using it over acrylics, because it's usually acetone based and can melt your painted parts. In order to avoid the destruction, I apply it fast and precise. It works kinda similar to nail polish, like when you apply a second layer you need to do it fast, otherwise the upper layer melts the bottom layer and you end up with a mess. So if you are not sure you can cover pieces in a single brush stroke, you would be better off sticking to acrylic paint. The legend of Utakuchi Onna tells that her hair turns into something like tentacles and works as arms to fit the second mouth. I wanna give her a short haircut but with two long thin braids on each side. And inside of each braid I will hide a wire. I pick the thinnest wires I had in stock to make sure they won't be shining through the hair too much but still help them keep form. Then I glue the wires to the head with super glue. I use gel like super glue because it doesn't lose as much volume when it dries comparing to regular super glue and can fill up the space if holes are too big. For short haircuts I prefer to use yarn hair because these are easier to style. As usual I brushed and ironed some acrylic yarn and then connected the fibers into wefts with normal PVA glue. And when it dries, the wefts are ready to use. I glue them directly to the head using the same old PVA glue, but only up to the point where I reach the wires. I let the glue dry and cut the hair with a razor for eyebrows, because later this area will be harder to reach. Then I glue some nylon hair around the wires for the future braids. For this part I use super glue, because nylon is way heavier, stronger and more slippery than yarn, and PVA might not be strong enough to hold the beast in place. And when the braids are ready, I continue gluing the wefts. And here I made two big mistakes. First of all, I forgot to make her bangs and I glued some hair too far back and it was interfering with her teeth, which is annoying. I still tried to cut her hair the way I wanted it to be, but it looked kinda meh. So <laughs> what I did, I just removed the top hair and glued them new. Luckily PVA is pretty weak glue, so it wasn't a problem at all and it didn't even leave any marks on her head whatsoever. And I had enough spare wefts to replace the old ones, so everything worked out fine. My inspiration for her haircut and style in general was Matilda from Leon the Professional, but I left the bangs a bit longer in a more Japanese way and cut the rest of her hair in a long bob, in order to highlight the teeth and give her a bit more of an edge.
Next up is her body. For repaints I buy used dolls in bundles on eBay, and this Dracula I had some body parts discolored from sunlight. I wonder, where is your SPF 500 gone, Dracula? I sand her body with fine sandpaper, and when it looks mud, I wipe it with spiritus in order to remove dust and oil from my fingers. Spiritus is a pure alcohol solvent, and comparing to acetone, it is safe for plastic surfaces, but still can be used for removing acrylic paint, for example, if you want to repaint your old Warhammer figurines. Some people use acetone free nail polish remover, but nail polish remover still contains some oils, so I would rather go for alcohol. Or vodka. Then I paint her with animal paint. It's harder to work with than acrylic paint, but at least it stands a chance to not chip off the joints right away. And if there is some dust stuck to it, you can carefully remove it with sandpaper. When the idea of this doll just popped up in my head, I wanted to make a traditional woman in kimono. And if she is a poor woman, it would make the most sense to dress her in a blue cotton kimono. Blue because only the higher social classes in Japan were allowed to wear bright colors, and cotton because lower classes were banned from wearing silk as well. And even though I decided to go for a modern design later on, I still wanted to add some traditional touches to her look. So I switched from kimono to haori. You can see people wearing it not only with traditional clothes, but in street style as well, so it feels like a right call. As a base, I use a pattern for Monster High kimono I made early in my video of making Nakima, and now I'll just add a couple of changes to turn it into haori. On the front panel I find a spot where the shoulder meets the neck hole and draw a vertical line. Everything that's right from it we don't need. Then, since haori is something people wear on top of a kimono, I need to make it wider, so I increase the shoulder length by 3mm and add the same allowance to the side of both panels. And because haori won't be worn with a belt, I don't need a curve on the back anymore, and can just get rid of it partly or completely and replace it with a straight line. In the traditional cut they never have curvy lines, but most the high dolls have pretty specific body shapes, and I had to accommodate for it. And now that I made the shoulder longer, I need to make the sleeve shorter. The pattern is ready, let's see how it works. For her haori, I bought this dark blue cotton fabric with Japanese traditional print called Yagasuri, or arrow feathers. In Japan, the symbol means aiming for a target, so I think it also fits the backstory I made up for her. I noticed that this fabric's backside looks just as good as the front, so I've decided to make the details mixed matched for a more grungy look. And I advise to always wash and iron cotton fabrics before sewing to make sure your clothes won't shrink later. I mean, it's not likely that a doll will wash her clothes or walk in the rainy weather, but it's always better to be safe than sorry, right? Usually I avoid using glue in sewing, but this time I've decided to use some textile glue on the bottom to protect the cuts. Textile glue needs to dry for 6 hours and then you can iron the piece through another piece of fabric to seal it with temperature. This connection is waterproof and can be washed as well, so she will be fine in any weather.
Besides the Haori, her outfit will include a pair of stockings, shorts and a crop top. For the stockings I use fine elastic mesh and shape it on the doll's leg. Then I add a rubber band with lace to the top of the stocking using small zigzag stitch. Never forget to use elastic types of stitches on elastic fabrics, if you don't want your seams to pop. Looks hot already. They say it works smarter, not harder, so this time I've decided to borrow the pants pattern from the original Monster High jeans. I removed all of the seams, ironed the pieces, cut off all of the ugly seam allowances, underlined both halves on top of each other and find the average outline. Adjust the length and the pattern is ready. Next up is the top. Here I use a basic pattern from Donna Beneviento as usual. This pattern is gonna be pretty simple and could be done without any base, but I think it's always better to have it at least as a reference. I attach the same lace I used on the stockings to the top as well to unite the top, shorts and stockings in one composition. Now everything looks like it belongs together. And the last thing for today is her shoes. This pair from Venus will complement her second mouth, don't you think? I removed the factory paint with acetone, sprayed the shoes with MSC and painted them black. I painted the teeth white and washed them with red and brown for a creepy look. I kinda feel like it makes sense for the shoes to not care about their dental hygiene anyway. And when I tried them on, I suddenly felt like there is not enough color to them. And I painted the shoelaces and seams with iridescent paint. 
I've learned the bad way that if you want it to look blue, you need violet paint. And if you want it to be violet, take blue. The paint itself has barely any pigment, and when it dries you will see mostly just glitter. In the video you can see that when I have just applied it, it looks violet, and when it dries it turns blue. Now everything is ready and let's have a look at the end result. In this project I mostly improvised, but I think in the end everything fits together pretty good. Tell me what you think in the comments down below and give this video a like to support the channel. If this video will get 500 likes, I will make another Japanese monster and we will turn it into a series. And if you would like to support me further, you can buy me a coffee, all the links you can find in the description box. Thank you very much for spending your time with me and I hope to see you soon in my next video. Bye!